Blog Talk Radio. Welcome to Voices for Change 2.0, the only podcast that focuses on mental health while mixing in movies, music, books, sports, and pop culture. Here are your hosts, Rebecca and Joe Lombardo. Hey, good morning, everybody. Welcome to Voices for Change 2.0. Yeah, thanks for tuning in this morning uh, on this almost last weekend of August. I think uh, next weekend is it. Mm-hmm. And, uh, man, this month went by fast. Yeah, I when, the, when, when the football started, I knew that we were in trouble. <laughs> I, I wouldn't <laughs> exactly call it trouble. Well, it's the Detroit Lions. It's trouble. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Put it like that. But yeah, know. no. As far as the, as far as the weather goes, I I always I always kind of give up on summer as soon as preseason football starts. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm out. I'm done. So yeah, so, it's exciting. yeah. So lately, um, we we're gonna try. What we're gonna do today is try to cover all of the uh, books, music. And then Sports and pop culture, yeah. So that, we, that our tagline, yeah, we're, that we fail miserably every week. On. <laughs> you know, I'm thinking actually about getting us an, an, a new song, but I like our song. Okay, I like our dude. All I, right. I don't know his name, but I like him. He's, okay, he's very authoritarian in how he sounds. <laughs> he's like, you will listen. <laughs> All right, so I am reading the book, The Handmaid's Tale. And uh, you know anybody that knows me knows that I'm kind of obsessed with the t- with the I don't call it a TV show, but it was it's well, on it is it's a on, TV show. It's on Hulu, but it's still a TV show. Yes, sir. Yes. And uh, I decided to start reading the book. Uh, funny because we have uh, Amazon um, or Kindle everywhere or some crazy thing like that, <laughs> so we can get certain books. Without paying for them, right? So that's one of the ones I can get without paying for it, and I was pretty excited about that. So let me tell you, it's very different from the TV show in a lot of ways. Um, if you are someone that doesn't like uh, an author to be incredibly descriptive about everything, you know, take a piece of wadded up paper and turn it into a, you know, half a chapter on this piece of paper. That's kind of what the, how kind of a writer Margaret Atwood is. Um, she's just so so descriptive, and I know my favorite author Anne Rice is is also that way, but not nearly to this degree. She's uh, I, I I asked back this when she was telling me about this the other day, and I, I liken it to Stephen King, mm-hmm. who while I, I have a lot of respect for for Mr. King and his writing. Um, I, you know, unless it's a short story, I can't read it. Uh, like I tried reading The Stand, and just uh, the amount of description he puts into everything, it was, you know, you, at some point you're like, okay, get on with the story. Yeah. You know? So, but that's that's me personally, not to not to slam Stephen King. You know, I'm not doing mm-hmm. that by any stretch. So, you know, uh, keep the hate mail to a minimum. <laughs> um. So yeah. So and then, you, uh, yeah, and aside from that. It looks like um, 13 Reasons Why started again, so I'm going to be checking that out. I I don't recommend that show for everybody. Um, I really think that, that they should put a really strong trigger warning on it. Mm-hmm. I know that they've been going through some, some issues with it and have had to take out some scenes from the first season, which is good because some of the stuff that they showed up close and personal is enough to trigger somebody Mm -hmm. for sure. Um, But I have respect for what they're trying to do with, with the show. And, you know, hopefully the season will be, you know, a little less triggering. Yes. Is, is a thing, but. And and the final thing I'll bring up and then we'll get to our guest is, uh, you know, I'm I'm a big Star Wars nerd. Okay, uh, for those of you that don't know, and uh, the trailer for the first ever live action Star Wars series uh, was dropped today. Uh, it's called The Mandalorian, and it's going to be on Disney's new streaming service, Disney Plus, 
when that debuts in November. And I'm telling you what, if you're a Star Wars fan or just a sci-fi fan, this thing looks really cool, guys. Uh, just putting it out there. Uh, if you get a chance, hop on YouTube, check out the trailer, because wow, <laughs> um, you know it, it's it's movie quality for sure. You know, uh, so it looks pretty cool, and it has Carl Weathers in it. That's right. Yeah. Uh, Apollo Creed is in this, so uh, that's exciting. <laughs> he was he was, he was Lando before he was Apollo Creed. No, you're you're mixing up Billy D. Williams. And oh, Carl you're Weathers. right. I am. You yeah. know. I always do that, and I don't know why. Why do you do that? that? They they've been in the same room together. They're not the same person. <laughs> You've so. seen them in separate places at yeah. once. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> All, right, All right. So for today, <laughs> our our guest today is a doctor, an author, a podcaster, and a survivor. She's uh, a well-known advocate on Twitter, and that's how I found her, incidentally. Mm-hmm. Um, and we do have to say that we're very grateful for her filling in today because we had someone else that had an emergency and, and couldn't make the show. And uh, she was, Dr. Has, Deb has been very uh, giving with her time. She's, um, you know, helped me out all this, this last week with promoting and, and getting the paperwork done and everything. And just been wonderful to work with. And she's also an, an Amazon bestseller. And she took what she learned from transforming her PTSD into growth, and she passes that information along to men, women, and children from all over. So please welcome Dr. Deb Lind. Hey, guys. Wow, look at that. <laughs> you got me all choked <laughs> up here. Thank you so much. That was very sweet. Thank you so much. We are so happy to have you with us. Uh, thank you for taking the time out of your what I would imagine is a very busy schedule, <laughs> uh, just looking at everything you got going on and, uh, you know, being on our humble little show. So thank you. Yes, we're very grateful. Well, you're welcome. Absolutely. I mean, you know, we have a lot of connections here. We're, we're all trying to do, you know, the same thing, which is helping people, um, providing information and education, and then also sharing, sharing our story, uh, you know, and that includes struggle. So whenever, you know, someone in our community, I actually like to use the word family, you know, because we really are mm-hmm. family, um, yeah. you know, need something. And it was just interesting how I just came up that, that thread. And I was really, the time that I thought I was supposed to be doing something else. And I remember saying to myself, okay, you need to stay focused. I'm like, no, 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 I just got to take a break. And there it was. And I thought, okay, let me just check and see. And um, so it all worked out. So thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, Absolutely. Absolutely. So do you have any questions for us before we dive into our questions? What questions do I have for you guys? Well, you know, what's really cool. It would be to have the listeners know as well as myself. I mean, I've looked at your information, so I've got a little bit of a shaping. Um, But maybe what we can do to start off is look at, you know, what is it that interests you guys about my story and how does it, how is it, you know, on the same path with, with both you guys. And that might give our listeners a good starting point of where, where to go. So that would be my question. How are we on this journey together? Cause we're certainly <laughs> walking the road together today. I mean, from what I've read, we're definitely walking that road together. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, just, you know, from, you know, Go, going and, and looking, you caught me off guard. Looking and uh, <laughs> going off of what what I, we had in our description, you know, you, you're a podcaster, we're podcasters. Um, you're an author, you know. Beck is an author as well, and and a survivor. And you're both survivors, yeah, and and, uh, and you both advocate on Twitter and. So it's kind of a parallel path, I think. Um, I, I think you've kind of taken it to the the next step with, you know, be, becoming a doctor and and you know doing some of the things that you're doing uh, with. Uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm trying to not, not jump ahead on our on our questions is what I'm, how I'm trying to <laughs> phrase this. So. Um, okay. And we're a little off guard. Nobody ever has a question for us. Yeah. <laughs> is that right? Oh yeah, my we gosh. Have, <laughs> yeah, we we asked, so, we asked it out of 
out of curi- yeah, yeah, out, of, out of courtesy, we ask that. And in in three years of doing this, no one's ever hit us with a question. So we're <laughs> oh we're tickled. My gosh. <laughs> well, you know, it, since you, since it's a stump moment, you know, when I when I'm with folks, um, just to add some humor, right? So people probably don't know unless you know of me or, or heard somebody who's worked with me. So if I ever stump somebody or someone gets has like a I, I, call, I hope, can we swear on this program? Is, is, can we swear? Just okay, be, I should ask that before. So I, 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 there's a phrase that you call oh shit. So if we have an oh shit moment, that gives folks <laughs> a pass to call me Debbie. Just once. Just once. So, <laughs> so you get a pass, Joe, to call me Debbie and Rebecca too. Okay, we, you know, one pass. This is a stump. <laughs> I think one of the cool things is, um, is the book. You know, you're reading a book, Rebecca, and you're talking about, you know, the nuggets that you're pulling out from it. And so we also have that connection, you know, again, being on the same journey of of, of self-education, right, and then sharing. And, Joe, I got to tell you, I'm not a Star Wars fan per se, but I am a Star mm-hmm. Trek person. Like, I've gone okay. to conventions. That's, like, I've taken exactly my kids good. out of school to go. <laughs> That that's absolutely acceptable. Uh, Star Star Trek okay. is uh, solid as well. Um, I'm more of a Star Wars fan, but I am a Star Trek fan very much. Um, I like the new ones. She likes yeah. Beck likes the new ones with uh, Chris Pine. I, I don't know that they're gonna make a fourth yeah. one at this point, but um, you know she got me the uh, the the original series movies um, Blu-ray a couple years ago. I think for Christmas mm-hmm. and. Uh, I was very tickled by that because she isn't a fan of that no. so much, <laughs> you know. But uh, you know, there's that, and also I'm, I'm very excited for uh, that new Picard series that's uh, coming out oh, on yeah. CBS Stream. Yeah. Have you? I don't know. Have you seen the trailer for that? No, no, I haven't. But I've I've seen the information on on social media. And um, mm. just a plug here for the hometown, right? The three one three. I was at the gym last night, and what was on the screen? Mm-hmm. Double screen. I had the tigers, and then the next screen was the lions. And I was like, Oh my <laughs> gosh, this is so great! <laughs> it was incredible. And I thought, Okay, so where's my cannoli from Bomberito Bakery, right? I mean, where there the you. hell is that? I mean, <laughs> yep. No, I, I hear I hear you on that. You know. Or your your pizza from Green Lantern Pizza, you know. Oh gosh. <laughs> yeah. Or Travis. Yeah. I mean, let's just let's just uh. throw it all out there, <laughs> right? <laughs> a five by five cheeseburger deluxe. Oh my gosh. Uh, See now we're going old uh, school here. We're going old school. People on that are listening are what? You guys got to go online and check these places out if you ever go to Detroit. Yeah. Those are some places <laughs> along with National Coney Island, right? Oh. Get yourself oh my a God, Coney. Yes. Yeah, See? you know, people people don't understand with the food in this in this town. This is, <laughs> you know, the, you hear about like going to Philadelphia and getting the cheesesteaks and all that, but they don't they don't know about coming to Detroit and getting the conies and and getting the the honeys and and everything else and oh they got oh yeah it. for sure yeah because I wasn't hungry enough for this yeah. population. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, see, Detroit's so, really a food place. I mean, it is. It really yeah. is. And um, I don't know why people don't think that. But anyway, so we've got anyway. – I'm a big Red Sox fan, though. So, I mean, you know, don't slam me for – I mean, I'll support the Tigers. I've got a dear friend of mm-hmm. mine who is a major, major Tigers person that can't figure out, like, okay, well, you're from 313, so why aren't you a Tigers girl? It's a long story. <laughs> but that's for another episode. But we can, actually, you know yeah. what, it really ties in – to um, sports and mental health. I mean, it really does. We could do a whole other segment on that. It would be great. Good. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. So, but you know, re- I have respect for the Red Sox. I don't know oh yeah, I don't have a problem know. with the Red Sox. Yeah, we like Boston. <laughs> My office yeah. is just like decked out. Like I got a Ted Williams, you know, MLB <laughs> official, you know, big thing on a picture on the wall. I've got a big banner and memorabilia from my first trip to Fenway. So uh, I got a Fenway wow. picture here. <laughs> I keep telling nice. my kids, whoever's having the first granddaughter, her name better be Fenway. And they're, I mean, they're still teenagers, but anyway, <laughs> 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 I'm already telling them, 
Oh, and by the way, yeah, it's not grandma. Your other kids, your kids are calling me yeah, yeah. You know, because I'm a Greek American. I'm like, nope, got to keep that tradition going. So, <laughs> <laughs> Big Poppy awesome. played for Boston, right? Right. Yeah. Say that. I'm yep. I like that. Big Poppy, he played for Boston. He was entertaining. Oh, yeah. Yep. Yeah, we're yeah. so yeah. well with his recovery too. You know, and keeping up with yeah. that yeah. too. Yeah. 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 That's a mess. So, all right, all right, so I guess we should get to the interview now. Yeah, we should probably get the <laughs> get to our questions here. I, I hope we answered your question sufficiently. To some degree. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, oh yeah, for sure. We're definitely on the same um, you know, we're walking the path together, which is great. Yeah. Well, speaking of paths and journeys, where does your mental health journey begin? Where does my mental health journey begin? You know, that's a really good question. Nobody has ever asked that question. Um, If I was to sum it up real quickly for um, the time that we have, um, my mental health journey began when I had a moment of I couldn't move my body, and I was having a flashback when one of my kids was in preschool. I was also working on my doctorate. Um, I was uh, three years in. So when you're working, my doctorate's in organization development, and it's an edu- so I have an EDD, which means it's an applied degree. It's a non-clinical degree. And um, so I don't do any diagnosing, but the work that I do is with the skill development part. That's where I come in, um, in trauma recovery. But anyway, so I'm working on my doctorate in organization development for folks that are like, what the hell is that? It's a combination between anthropology, sociology, and psychology. So the reason why wow. I chose that study of field is, I learned about the psychology of people as well as the society, the sociology, and then also the undercurrents of culture, which is where anthropology comes in. And because we all come from different heritages and those things affect our values and beliefs and our morals and the way that we think. So when working with folks, you know, and when you have a degree in OD, especially a doctorate, you're looking at three different things. So, how is the societal impact, the cultural impact, as well as the psych impact? Um, but getting back to your question, one of my kids was in preschool and they were doing this musical thing, and I'm sitting on one of those little chairs that, as an adult, you're just lucky that your body can still fit in it. Um, and <laughs> yep. I'm watching her, and I had a. Um, a flashback moment from my childhood and my daughter is running up to me saying, mommy, 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 let's go get a cookie. But I couldn't move. I, I physically could not move and I was frozen and I'm looking at her, but yet I'm, I felt like I was watching a movie of myself mm. and I didn't know what was going on. And I was like, I, I need to move. And, and the next thing I remember was being at the cookie, you know, a little, table and my kid wanting to get another chocolate chip cookie and I'm thinking something's seriously wrong yeah. and I met with my uh, my doctor my general practitioner and I told him what happened you know and he's sitting there we're in this room and he, you know the exam room and he's sitting on a stool and he and he said um I think you've got PTSD but I don't know for sure And the best I can do right now is to give you a referral to a psychotherapist and write you out a prescription. And literally he was getting, he was getting ready to do the prescription thing. And I said, well, prescription for what, you know? Mm -hmm. And, and he said, well, this is, you know, what, what we have to help. And what's interesting is I had known this doctor for many years. You know, he was the guy who delivered my daughter. So I mean, it had been, you know, years in a relationship And I said to him, let me ask you this question. I said, every year, people earn their doctorates every year. And when you get a doctorate, you have to provide information that is new to the field. So it has to be innovative. You can't do something that's been done. If you do, it has to be tweaked in some way to make it new. So imagine making a new recipe every time someone graduates, right? You can be inspired by something else, but it has to be new. Not adding to the body of knowledge, but new. And I said, so this is the best we have. You're going to give, I did, I got mad. I'm like, you're going to give me a referral (laughs) to a psychotherapist and then write me out a prescription. That's it. I'm like, how many thousands of doctors get their damn degrees every year? I was pissed. And (laughs) 
<laughs> feel so bad for that. Anyway, I'm, I've, we've seen each other since <laughs> this. But anyway, I left the office, and that was a Friday, and I went to school on Monday, and I said to the university, my the dean there, who was also my dissertation chair, I said, I'm changing everything. I'm not going to study entrepreneurship anymore. I'm scrapping everything. This is ridiculous because I couldn't function. I mean, I was like laying on the couch and afraid to be outside and being at Target and everything, like the lights and the sounds. And my hands were like dripping, sweating. And I'm like, this, this something mm. is not right. And so yeah. to answer the question of where my journey began, it began at that moment in the preschool with my you know, my daughter and having a flashback moment and then also being told, hey, these are your options. And I'm like, yeah, no, I don't think so. There's got to be another way. And people can go ahead and go online and, and, and learn more about, you know, well, who the heck is this woman? Man, she's only five foot two with this funky ass red hair, but she's a spitfire. <laughs> and I, I say that because I can't imagine if I would have just gone along with the crowd and said, okay. Yeah, okay. And I think about mm-hmm. the people that are listening right now who've actually said, you know, you put your trust in your physician and you put your trust that, well, they, they know something that I don't know, right? They know they know right. what's best for me, right? And it's not that he didn't. It's just that, in my opinion, what he should have done was said, look, these are our options that we have right now. What path do you want to go down? Knowing me as a person, yeah. as a patient, what path do you want to go? So when I went back to school, my dissertation guy, amazing individual, he actually does some work on use of self. His name is Dr. David Jamison. People want to look up something that's really helpful with this journey called use of self. It's a concept about knowing who you are and how you affect the world around you. Um, was like, well, you're going to have to redo some stuff and make up time. And I'm like, yeah, no problem with that. So that's how the journey started. And it been an interesting journey. It's been an interesting <laughs> path, but definitely one that if people were to say, you know, you think you're onto something and it's like, well, I know I'm onto something. I actually was thinking about this this morning, how different life is today than what it was then. Yeah, yeah sure. You know, it's, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's wild that, you know, you just be sitting there hanging out hanging out with your kid doing whatever, watching her doing her thing. And all of a sudden, bam, you know, you've got this thing from your past just hitting you out of nowhere, you know. Um, I've been there. Yeah. I've been there and it's incredibly uncomfortable and not predictable at all. And what is actually going to be the outcome of it? It's, it's, it's an incredibly invasive feeling. feeling. It's, 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 uh, (laughs) <laughs> can't can't talk about it too much because it'll upset me, but I know exactly what you're talking about. You know, the weird thing about that was I asked, because um, I did, I, I, what I, to piggyback off this, um, I was on the couch for two weeks. I mean, I had two mm. little kids and I'm on the couch. This is so not like me. The only thing that was mm-hmm. not like, you know, like me, like Deborah was watching daytime talk shows. I remember laying there thinking, what the hell is wrong with me? This isn't like me. I mean, I'm like high energy, let's go, let's do this. You know, I got, I mean, you see my office walls, I got sticky notes everywhere. Cause it's like, okay, planning and, and everything just, you know, and I love that about myself, a high energy and usually really happy. And I'm on the couch and I'm watching Dr. Phil, honest to goodness. Mm-hmm. If my friends were, I mean, I've told them all that I was watching Dr. Phil but I really do believe that things happen that are co- not coincidental, but they really do happen. And there's like, okay, you need something, you need some information. Guess what? It's going to come. Right. So I'm watching right. Dr. Phil and he had this lady on, and I have the book right here, Carl McBride. And her book is called, will I ever be good enough? And it's a book about hmm. healing daughters of narcissistic mothers. And I'm watching this program and I'm crying because I'm like, oh, my God, that is me. I look it up, and my local Barnes & Noble had the book. I put it on hold, and I need to tell you something. Going to Barnes & Noble to get that book, I felt like I had this big neon sign with a flashing pointing arrow saying, it's her. This is her. It's her. It's her. It's her. It's her. It's her. 
I read the book, seriously, like in a couple of days. And then I went online, you know, putting my doctorate to use right at that point. I was just a candidate, but researching, mm-hmm. okay, where can I find a specialist, a therapist a, who specializes in narcissistic mothers and daughters of recovery? And um, one thing that I would like people to, to take away um, is that you interview a person who is going to help you. And because what happens usually is we find somebody based on, oh, do you have a doctorate? Oh, are you a, are you a licensed psychotherapist? Or oh, are you a life coach that does trauma recovery? And then people latch on and go, okay, yeah, I'm going to do that. And then they find out, well, why isn't this working? Mm-hmm. We need to interview people. And that's exactly what I did. I, I called, uh, I found a few people and then I called two of them. I'm like, all right, I got the list narrowed down to two. And if not, then I'm going to circle back to the whole list. And the first person I talked to, I, I mentioned, I said to her, I'm going to call somebody else. And if we don't click, I'll call you back and we'll schedule an appointment. But what I wanted to know were things very specific, like why did you get into this field? What is your why? How do you help people? What's your plan? Do you have a plan? Do you have an action plan? What does your you know, practice look like? Are you available after hours? Do you respond to email? Do you respond to text messaging? You know, what happens if I have an emergency after hours? All of those things, right? Right. What's your personality? What's your style? Because we do things, people hire based on skill, but it's really, it's really a, an emotional fit if we fit with people. But I found a gal who, uh, Dr. Barbara Krupp, she's retired now, but um, amazing individual. And that was the, another turning point was being on the couch, watching Dr. Phil, finding this book. And that is like the book that's made it for me as far as, okay, now, now what, now that you understand some of this stuff, now what are you going to do next? How are you going to help yourself? Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. You know, that's, that's the thing is, is you go through, you know, I, I think you, you make a valid point with, with actually interviewing the people that are going to help you. I couldn't begin to tell you how many doctors we went through with Beck in the last 18 years before we found uh, the doctor that she sees today, um, not literally today, but you know what I mean? Um, right. You know, it's it taken a lot of years and went through a lot of doctors that just. A lot of therapists too. Yeah. That just were not a good fit. You know, you, you have to find a provider that, you know, is really, it's, it's, it's going to be beneficial for, for you, you know, you're the one seeking the help and, you know, you, you have to recognize if that person is going to be good for you or not. And there are doctors that just aren't a good fit with some people. It just, right. it, it's, it's fact of life, you know, um, we're right. going to take, we're, we're, we're going to take a, a minute here and take our first break um, just because it's, we're like 25 minutes in. Um, and this has been a really good conversation so far and, and you know, want to get back to it. But, uh, you know, so, some people might need to, I don't know, go potty. <laughs> so um, we're going to be listening to uh, Dear My Future Self by David Hernandez. Everybody stay tuned. We'll catch you on the, on the other side of this.
a struggle, it's a struggle, it's a struggle to find me. When the world breaks. Faith, you gotta keep on. You gotta keep up. You gotta be strong. Be strong. Be strong. You gotta keep up. You gotta be strong. Don't lose the faith. You gotta keep on. You gotta keep up. You gotta be strong. Be strong. When the world breaks, you stand tall. When you feel pain, you fight it off. When they go low, you go high. You're gonna the storyline The soldiers don't believe in you Welcome back to Voices for Change 2.0. I'm Joe, without a voice, apparently. <clears throat> um, the beautiful woman sitting next to me is my lovely wife, Rebecca, <laughs> who is shaking her head profusely at what I'm saying about her. She's so stinking. Especially cute. at 1130 in the morning. She's not, so, not so beautiful. She's so stinking cute, you guys. You don't even know. I'm a, I'm a lucky guy. <laughs> and on the line, we have Dr. Deb. That's right. Dr. Deb Lind is talking with us today, and uh, we are so happy and honored to have her on our show. Um, just the stuff that she does is, is awesome. It's it's amazing. Um, she's a very busy gal. Yes, very. You know, a five, as she like to say, as she like to say, uh, a five foot two Spitfire. <laughs> so, how's, how's it going there, Spitfire? <laughs> It's going all right. It's going really well. Thank you very much. I love how you guys talk about each other. That is just so, so sweet. It really is. It really is. I love, you know, the other day I was at the park with my kids and and our dog, Max, and there were two senior couples walking hand in hand. And one couple, I asked them how long that they were together. 35 years. 35 years and they're walking down, you know, in a park holding hands. And the other one I can't remember wasn't as, as long um, but 35 years, so uh, it's so sweet to hear you guys talk about each other like that. It's wonderful. Yeah, that'll that'll be us. I mean, we're we just celebrated 18 years, so you know. Oh my gosh, it's wonderful. Yeah. Oh my yeah, gosh. Yeah, she's not she's That's not sick great. of me yet, or wants to trade me in. So <laughs> I must be doing something right. Some some days I want to take you out back and shoot you. Thanks, babe. <laughs> Love of my life, ladies and gentlemen. The love of my life. Oh my goodness! But, uh, data, you know, like pick your pick your stick, right? Get your switch. I was we were picking up yep. sticks. We had a we had a big storm here in, in the Twin Cities, and so you know, I was saying the kids go out and you know pick up the sticks, and you know, of course, they were dragging their feet. And I said, hey, let me share you a story about how Mom grew up. When I was asked to go out in the backyard and pick up a stick, it was not just to pick up sticks. You know, they're looking at me and I'm like, I mean, because I've shared some stuff with the kids, you know, um, not, not, not a lot, but there are certain things that, yeah, I've shared and it was more to, you know, make a jovial, you know, comment. I think one of the things about this recovery is when you can laugh at some of the things that has happened. And I can tell you that a few years ago, I don't think I would have been able to laugh about picking a switch in the backyard with my, there's no way I can tell you right now I yeah. would have been like yeah that's not funny but there are yep. there are times where on your journey of healing and recovery where you can look at some of the stuff and say that was the most ridiculous thing the most ridiculous thing and you can you can laugh about it now and I think that mm-hmm. is one of the biggest aha awareness moments for folks is 
to know that there's hope that you can get to that place and that there will be things that you'll look at and say, oh, my God, that was so ridiculous. So, so yeah. ridiculous. And you can laugh about it today. Not everything, but there are, there are some Not things where you can laugh at stuff. Yeah, you can, right. you can find, you know, here and there where, yeah. it's, where it's chuckleable. <laughs> So, okay. That's an interesting word. <laughs> Thank you. I just thought of it. Um, all right. So back to the questions. Um, what is mindful effect? Mindful effect is so with the work that I do. There's two different two different branches, if you want to say. Mindful effect is part of the work that I do, which is to bring awareness based training to individuals who are overcoming trauma. And why it's called mindful effect is because we use techniques that are evidence-based, so they're rooted in science, right? It's not just something that's pulled off the shelf and said, oh, this is a good idea, but it's rooted in mm-hmm. some sort of evidence, scientific evidence that shows clinically that it does work, okay? But it's adapted for practical use. So, for example, one of the things that I did uh, early on, in O we have this phrase, I'm the scientist and, the, and the, the experiment, okay? So basically I'm the person who's in the, you know, the mad scientist in the lab that's creating all this stuff, and then I also use it. I took that a step further. So I became the patient, the researcher, the practitioner, the scientist, and the innovator. So I put myself in outpatient programs for post-traumatic stress, for um, stress management, and, you know, different hospitals. We've got a few in the Twin Cities that are amazing. Of course, we also have the Mayo Clinic, so i got to do a plug there. Mm-hmm. Those folks are doing <laughs> awesome work, as well as the Penny George Institute, which is one of the places that I did go. And I adapted some of the tools to accommodate for being able to use wherever I was at. So basically, Mindful Effect is a education house, if you will, that does training, and the training is, predominantly whether um, we do it online or in a group setting or in organizations, because I do have a business background. So I spent over 25 years in different business roles. Um, And so organizations with high risk, for example, like construction, uh, fire service, military, law enforcement will say, hey, you know what, we got a situation here. We want some training. Can you come on in and help us? And how can we use those, those tools in the field I don't have to stop and look at my phone. I just know how to do it because I've learned how to do it, and I'm developing a new habit with the skill, and I can do it reflexively, just like you blink or swallow. So that's what mindful effect wow. is. Cool. Mm-hmm. And what about PMBSR? Yeah, practical mindfulness-based stress reduction. So why it's called practical mindfulness is because, again, we're not using mindfulness techniques in a – uh, I call it a closed setting or a clinical setting. It's where you can use this stuff in your everyday life. Um, so hmm. one of the challenges that I found when I was first, you know, going on this journey was the practice became regimen, meaning I have to schedule time. I need to go someplace. And it was all things that actually added to the freaking stress as opposed to making it easier. The other thing that I was like, wait a second here, is I was in a situation where I took a class, and it was a mindfulness class, which was it was really more of a meditation class. So my definition of mindfulness is awareness. It's not meditation. They're totally two different things. But sometimes people think, well, mindfulness is meditation. No, it's not. Mindfulness, if you look up the word, it means awareness. So we do awareness-based training versus meditation. But anyway, I'm in this mindfulness class, and the provider's teaching meditation, and you're supposed to sit, like, cross-legged, you know? Well, I can't do that. Ever since I had kids, I I can't sit that way. My hips just don't do that anymore. It hurts. (laughs) But yet he's saying, you know, breathe through the pain, and I'm, like, thinking to myself, what if I was in a wheelchair? How would this work for me? Because I do know yeah. people. I have friends that are in wheelchairs. What if I was a diabetic and I had neuropathy? That wouldn't work. What if I had Parkinson's and I can't control my mo- my balance, right? I, my involuntary motion. But this practitioner mm-hmm. was so focused on the practice, and I'm like, we're losing the essence of why we're doing this. So again, yeah. what I did was I adapted things and tested it out. 
Um, because one of the things getting your doctor is you've got to go through this rigorous of, okay, go test your theory and see if it works. And so what I did was I contacted a bunch of different organizations and said, all right, I want a big Fortune 500 company and I want an entrepreneur organization because I didn't want somebody at the, when you're defending yourself, right, in your research to say, oh, well, you just did a Fortune 500 company. What, how would this work in a small environment? So I, I right. both and adapted and modified specifically for being able to use whenever, wherever, however. And that's what the practical part means. Okay. Um, To that that end, um, do your individual clients, do they come from your, you know, the stuff you do corporately or can anyone attend the programs? You know, somebody walk in off the street can they reach out to you and, and you know what I mean? Yep. That's a good question too. Cause I, people have asked that also, I just got an email from someone that I worked with. This is really super cool. I wonder if I can find it right now to read to you. Um, it's a gal that I did a um, mindfulness workshop that was online. And um, this was two years ago and she sent a note saying that she did the work every day over and over again, you know, and mm-hmm. the wonderful changes that she made in her life. It was it was really cool. But the answer to the question is yes. So organizations, you know, I work with organizations as well as individuals. And we've got a new class um, coming out in um, October. And people mm-hmm. can go sign up on drdeblin.com um, to be put on the list for uh, the announcement of being able to register. Now, that class is going to be a small group because the other thing that I have found is that when I've done larger classes, so a large class is anything that's 25 and over, and I've done large groups, up to 200 people in one setting, and wow. I don't like to do those because what I have found is that people really want to have the one-on-one attention and guidance, and it's impossible. It's, it's very difficult to, to give people the personalized attention, and um so when I do work in corporations, it's groups of 25 max. Um, I've got an upcoming one where we've, I've said, you know, there's a five that are on a wait list in case someone doesn't mm-hmm. show or they cancel out. Um, but groups that are, you know, 25 and smaller are fantastic. And then um, one-on-one assistance, because what I found is that our details are different and some are the same. But when somebody has a question, when you make a connection with a person, and they really feel like, hey, you know what, I'm being heard. I'm being listened to. And you know what, I've got some really good stuff and I want to go try it. Or someone has a breakthrough, this is really common too. So one of the things when I do mm-hmm. work is I'll make, you know, I always say like we've got some boundaries here. And, and one is I don't touch people because what I, unless it's okay, unless they say yes. Because what I have found is that this doing this work is that when you touch somebody, it can it can be triggering for them or it can actually be so emotionally overwhelming that, you know, they get unfocused. And the whole point is to to give people tools and and skill development. When I say that though, and I'm smiling as I say that, whenever we go over like a ground rules, another one is like what we talk about here is similar to Vegas, right? What happens in Vegas stays in Vegas unless it's, you know, (laughs) a self harm, you know, then I've got to, you know, we've got to report it. Right. Um, Right. It is, so not it is so like this happens frequently you make these boundaries right no hugging right especially with guys because the other thing that i found especially when i work in fire service is the next thing i know i'm like i'm like being called sister you know okay so you're one of Mm. us right anytime you know you you need anything it's like okay cool um and that's Mm. great because you know the camaraderie and the connections are there right you build those lifelong relationships it's not uncommon though to have somebody just bolt out of their chair and run up and just grab and hug me, you know, and they just want to show yeah. appreciation and gratitude for their breakthroughs. But to answer your question, the answer is yes. So corporate work I do as well as individual keep the group small because of being able to really get to know someone as well as to give them that personalized attention. And another way that we can look at this is on Twitter. So when people like send me, messages or they post something to the Twitter feed and I'll 
post a video because I think to myself, well, if this person has this question, somebody else does too. So let's just do, you know, a 10-second video or a minute and 30-second video. And what's really interesting is people are like, oh, my gosh, you actually really do look at your own stuff. It's like, yes, <laughs> I really do look at my own stuff. And, yes, I'm really talking to you. If I made the video and you asked the question, this is for you. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, that is very cool. You know, that's and it's it's a good feeling when you know that the person you're reaching out to is is actually acknowledging you and you know giving validation to what you ask mm-hmm. and you know trying to actually help you. You know, um, yeah, that's important. Yeah, because there's a lot of times when you may reach out to somebody on Twitter and either not get a response at all or not get the type of response that you're hoping for and it can leave you feeling kind of lost in a sense Mm -hmm. you know I always warn people about that you know if you're in a really bad place mentally or emotionally be very careful who you reach out to on, on Twitter because they could be really busy and just not see your message right away and meanwhile, you're thinking, oh, they're ignoring me or they don't right. care or whatever the case may be. And it just makes everything worse for you. So I think that's right. really I important. Thought about that and, too. Yeah, mm-hmm. and really, really amazing that you get back to people in, in, in that way. And I think it can only help the situation yeah. that we're in right now. I agree with that. I agree with that. I try my very best, and I, and I will say that I'm conscientious of going through, like, the feed. The one thing that I have found, though, is that sometimes I'll see something, and then I'll go back to go look at it, and I can't find it on the feed. So I mm-hmm. often wonder about that, too. Like, okay, has somebody posted something, and they they wanted me to respond, and yet I missed it somehow because it's, again, lost in the feed? Um, and the other thing that's a challenge about Twitter, too, is communication, you know, it's like we don't, that's another reason why I'm posting the little videos because I want to make sure that we're looking at every possible, you know, risk of misinterpretation or not being heard. Because one of the things that I've found is that it's a beauty that, you know, we do have, say, the Twitter feed available, you know, 24-7, 365. So when someone needs assistance, there's somebody there who can answer, right? But mm-hmm. we need to look at the quality of the response as well as, um, you know, is it, is it helpful? Because I've also made it recently very clear that um, we're in a volatile time right now. There's so many people that are experiencing post-traumatic stress symptoms, even though they're not, not, not let's just say even though to diminish, but the point is a person doesn't, if, if somebody might not be clinically diagnosed, but they can still have the effects of post-traumatic stress symptoms. And, Sometimes things can escalate unnecessarily so, and it can be just a matter of let's take a moment and, and read and, and seek to understand versus judge. So yeah. on Twitter, um, it's a great resource to be helpful. And, and I agree, if there's somebody who needs immediate assistance, it's probably best to call an 800 you know, uh, outreach number versus mm-hmm. waiting for someone to respond because that can actually have a spiraling effect for someone. And, and exactly. if we wor- wor- work from the mindset that we're all really trying to do our best, then um, I think that helps because then people won't feel like no one's listening to me. I really feel really alone and I don't matter because that can mm-hmm. happen yeah. on Twitter. And, and speaking of Twitter, you host a PTSD chat on there. Um, Want to tell our listeners a little bit more about that? Yeah, so the chat is, is called PTSDI. There's an I in between there, chat. So it stands for Post Traumatic Stress Disorder Injury. And the reason why we've got the I there is because some people are, are advocating for a change with the diagnosis, diagnostic label, if you will. It's, in, it's moving it from Post Traumatic Stress Disorder to Post Traumatic Stress Injury. Um, I believe that I have an injury. I don't believe I have a disorder. I mean, I looked up the research and I understand the story of why they know the group of psychiatrists came up with this label. They needed a label. Um, I find it interesting that everything has a disorder to it, whether it's, you know, OCD or ADHD, you know, this, this disorder component is on there. But anyway, so post the PTSD chat 
is every Monday at 8 o'clock Eastern Standard Time where we talk about all different types of things related to post-traumatic stress with anyone who's been affected with and by PTSD. Why I say anybody is because we have people that are providers that can have secondary trauma. We have Mm -hmm. folks that are providers that actually provide assistance. There are educators, researchers, people with post-traumatic stress. There are people who are caregivers and spouses. Um, There's a group of kids from the local middle school and high school that monitor uh, and moderate the uh, the chat, which is super cool because now they do, you know, uh, peer support within the schools and um, we're coming up to our year anniversary in October actually for the uh, PTSDI chat. That's awesome. Yeah. That's great to hear that the the kids are getting involved. You know, um, we've been advocating for that for a couple of years now that, you know, more needs to be done in the schools and the fact that you've got these kids stepping up and, you know, be, becoming involved um that's just that that makes me happy mm-hmm. <laughs> well you know what's really cool that. About, that makes me happy yeah the, the kids are so um, i mean working with the kids they they get it and ha- meaning they their awareness and their openness is different than working with adults so i've done work with the um department of education here in the in the state of minnesota I, I also do advocacy work and pro bono work for um, schools, and that's mm-hmm. my way of giving back because, and I actually do that too with other folks. There have been people who are like, look, you know what, can you just help me out here? And the reason why I do that is because there have been so many people that have helped me, and um, it's my way of just saying, okay, I'm paying it forward. Uh, the kids to do stress management, mindfulness training with the kids in different school districts around the Twin Cities, um, I'd actually love to come back and do some stuff with the high school that I graduated from. I'd like to rewalk those halls and share with the kids the story of what that, you know, girl looked like and who she is today. Because what I have found is that when you can touch a child's life that way, that's why educators are so they are. They, they've got the cape on every day. They've got the superhero cape mm-hmm. on every day. Because when you can touch a child that way, and they might not be getting it at home, but you can do that for that child, it is an incredible and an emotional experience. And it makes everything just like, wow, you know what? So, yes, there is beauty in ashes. So I can take this manure and look at this flower totally bloomed and, and grew there there are kids where um i've startled kids that i've worked with meaning like okay you're at like a function you know like a fourth of july function or some sort of carnival with your own family and then mm-hmm. the kids will stop dead in their tracks and they're like oh my gosh it's you it's like yes it's me oh who are you <laughs> here with you know it's like i'm here with my own kids you know yeah and they're like oh my gosh you know and then to have parents share stories um the youngest kid i've worked with was in kindergarten and to have the mom and dad the mom was crying so much she couldn't talk i mean she was like doing the you know type breathing and i was like okay we need to get your breathing to get regulated you know and the dad was like um we can't thank you enough they were able to go out to dinner their child had so much anxiety and they were to the point of um you know, putting their child on medication, but they didn't want to. And I did a mm-hmm. mindfulness six-week class at one of the local schools, and they enrolled their child, and um, kids just taken off. I mean, into sports and just has a lot of friends and is happy. And Aww. it's like we can't control what our kids see and what they witness, right? So it's not always, mm-hmm. well, the family, because people will say that, well, it's the family environment. No, we've got stuff everywhere. Our children are, are affected by all kinds of stuff that they see and that they, they hear. And when they can work with someone that they connect with and learn, say, you know, um, skills to, you know, to cope and to self-regulate, it makes such a difference. But when you get that feedback from people on how, you know, again, the manure has grown something beautiful, you know, then mm-hmm. you can look at yourself in the mirror and say, you know what, I did good today and go to bed. Cause we're never guaranteed that we're going to wake up. So every day we wake right. up, it's 
a gift to be able to do our very best. And our very best can look different every day. Some days, you know, maybe it's going outside and standing on your porch and that's your aha moment. Or another day, maybe it's, you know what, I actually, you know, washed my face, took a shower, brushed my teeth and got myself ready. And I did some work today. It looks different every day, but what's important for folks to understand is that when we do work with children, it affects and it can affect their entire life just as much as if we work when we work with adults. See, we still have time. This conversation came up yesterday with the person. Mm-hmm. They're 31 years old, and they're complaining about how nothing's working. Nothing's working, nothing's working, nothing's working. And so then I said, are you willing to – make a commitment so you're making the decision that you're going to do this work you're going to commit to it and you're going to do something every day for two years and she was just like oh my gosh two years you know I mean I was hearing like all the balking and whatever and probably maybe there's even mm-hmm. listeners that are saying two years and I said to her but you have at least another 30 years statistically on this planet in 30 years you'll be 61 years old what's two years out of 30 yeah. And then she was like, I never thought about that. Like, I'm like, okay, well, you need to think about that. And if you're ready, <laughs> then let's regroup and we can get some epic shit done. That's what I said. <laughs> See, I'm not for everybody, but I am for some people. And, it, yeah. and it's for people who are like, I've tried so many things. And, and at the same time, I like the directness, but I also need someone who's going to be, you know, a gentle giant, not someone who's going to be like in my face. Because I don't think that in my face stuff works. I think the in my face stuff actually is even more triggering. And I can say that's true for when I've worked with kids as well as adults. But it is cool when you see kids that you've done stuff with and they're like, what are you doing here? And I'm like, what are you doing here? You know, Mm -hmm. well, I'm here at the 4th of July Maple Grove days. I'm like, I'm here at the Maple Grove days too watching the 4th of July with my kids. (laughs) Well, hey, Dr. Deb, uh, I, I hate We're to do this. We're having a great conversation. We're having an awesome conversation. And when there's stuff that we didn't get to get to, to talk to talk with you about. Um, but we're, we'll just we're have to have you winding back down. On. Yeah, we need to have you back on because we didn't get to talk about your book coming out. We didn't get to talk about your podcast. And we, we really want to highlight those, too. So we're we're definitely going to have you back. But we have to uh, we have to call it a day for the day. And um I'm sorry, because <laughs> we've 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 loved talking to you. You know, it's 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 uh it's been great. Really quickly, can you give us a couple of your uh, social media links so people know where to look for you? Oh, for sure. So on Twitter, people can find me at um, Deborah D E B R A and then Lind L I N D H. I'm also on Instagram at Dr. Deborah Lind, and then the website is there's two of them. So one for mindfulness based training. And that is uh, mindfuleffect.com. And then also mm-hmm. the main website is drdeblind.com. And if anyone um, wants to reach out, they can go ahead and connect on Twitter through DM. Um, and also there's the, the podcast, which is PTSD and Beyond, and that's on um, iTunes and then Google Play. Awesome. That's great. Well, thank you so much for sharing those. Stay on the line, and uh, we are going to close out the show with James Cobb. And if I could, I'll thanks see you guys for next week. Being here, guys. Yeah, awesome. thanks, thanks for, thanks for in. having me on, guys.
Join us next week as Rebecca and Joe continue to battle the stigma of mental illness. Follow us on Twitter at Voices for Change RJ and on Facebook at Voices for Change 2.0.